me and Steve had got much more specific plans around this happiness thing, and we were going to seriously consider playing live with that, like with me and him again. Um, we've got new stuff that we've been working on, not because it's like, oh, listen to our new songs, but that that also needs to be finished. I am delighted to say I'm with John Marsh from The Beloved. How are you, John? I'm good, thank you, Phil. Yeah, just we got there in the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did. We had a, a few yeah. trouble, troubles with technology. I've no idea what happened, but it happened. I spent the whole morning, we've been walking around, and like as you do, just singing Fat Larry's band, Zoom. And then, of course, Zoom let us down. So, yeah. <laughs> it's all your fault, John. Oh, yeah. You, no, it's your fault. You tempted it's fate. Your... Now, the last time I yeah. spoke to you, it was last August. We were just chatting just briefly before we started recording. It was an easier time, wasn't it? It was pre-lockdown. It was a different world. Yeah. It literally was a different a different world. And not only that, you were the kind of, I think you were the first proper interview that I did actually at the start of that cluster. And obviously, uh, I've had quite a lot of stuff going on over the last year, which has been great. So it's very nice to uh, to reconnect. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I second yeah. that because I feel honoured that I was the first. Cause... I'm probably going to completely contradict everything I ever said in the first. <laughs> a lot of people were posting on YouTube on that on that video on the interview, and they were saying, "Wow, yeah. wow, you got John out of hibernation." It's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I wish I wish you'd chosen a better still. That was the only thing. But the one is is like it is it's an up chin shot that's really unflattering Aww. shot. Oh, I, I, I couldn't see any badness. There was, there was nothing, no, no, nothing no. negative no, at all. You know, you know what it's like. You know, no, no, no it's quite funny because it's like I hadn't been seen in public for like twenty odd years, and then you come back. It's like, oh, he's changed. Well, yeah. You know. Because <laughs> how's your experience of this year been? Because it has been a pretty chaotic year, quite crazy. Well, I learnt, I learnt the extent of my ability to grow a full beard. That's what I've learnt this. Year. That's always good. <laughs> I managed to get a real straggly one at one point, and then and then my kids were so mean to me that I had to kind of trim it on on a really obvious level. That all the uh, materialistic stuff that I like to surround myself with is completely irrelevant when it comes down to it. You know, I mean, I know that's a truism that maybe people you kind of know that, but it's quite interesting to have that put into reality. Um, because we came away with our three teenagers um, to Cornwall before lockdown, because I'd been quite ill last year, and I didn't, I was kind of, you know, a little bit nervous about it, although in, in retrospect, I, I think I'm be, I'll be fine. But um, so, um, and we lived as a family in very close quarters, and although occasionally, as families do, you drive each other nuts, it was it was beautiful. You know, I mean, when when will I ever be able to force my t- teenage sons to actually sit down and have a meal with me every single night? Wow. <laughs> because why would you? You know, when I was 15, there's no way I'd have done that. You know, and it's just stuff like that, actually. The fact that at the end of it, we still get on fine. We, you know, communicate. And, you know, that that you have to find the positives. You have to find them. And the simplicity of that... Obviously, there's a lot of terrible stuff going on, and it's not over by long chalk. Um, and that's just the pandemic stuff. So, Christ, you know, there's, it's not a great time to be a teenager. So, um, you know, I, I, I feel I owe it to them to try to give them some kind of, like, uplift as well. It's funny, isn't it? It's the things that you think are small pleasures, but they actually turn out to be big pleasures, and you, you kind of forget that. Yeah, yeah, completely. Also, with that, you know, funnily enough, I I, I had a ch- opportunity to to reconnect with people that you know, obviously not face to face, but when haven't been locked, if the whole world's all locked in together, I think a lot of people reached out um, in a, in a remote way, and that was really interesting as well. Just had quite deep conversations with people that I haven't spoken to properly for quite a long time, so that was really good. So you know, those you have to find the human bits, I think, in in the middle of of a kind of shitstorm really yeah, you know, definitely yeah. well one of the positives of this year was happiness being expanded and reissued yeah. were you happy with that 30th anniversary release because it was picked up on and you know the critics and the fans were joyous about it were you joyous as yeah, well? I, was very ha- I was very happy we remastered the audio in February <laughs> I'll tell you that because <laughs> otherwise, otherwise that wouldn't have been happening so um, yeah it was pure good timing that it was all done and you know we got it all put to bed the audio side of it the 30 year thing is is actually coincidental it wasn't a you know it it's this is the year this is the point in our lives when we've got into a situation into 
a circumstance where we could think about doing something like that. And it, had it been last year or next year, it would have been the same. But yeah, 30 year, I guess, you know, we didn't put 30 a year edition on the front of it because that's just crass. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's been really, really good. We, I, 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 again, lockdown enabled me to to reconnect with Bob Linney, who's the guy who did all our artwork. And I, you know, had long phone calls with him, then a lot of email communication. And we kind of, what you know he did some new artwork for us and stuff like that so things like that were lovely because they took a bit longer to do them without being able to be in a room with someone but you know it it's all doable getting everything coordinated we ended up putting it back i think a week at the end because the genius bit of the, the one thing having got everything <laughs> together and everything sorted the factory had to have them specially cut with a special machine and the machine broke down and the guy who's supposed to repair the machine was furloughed, so they couldn't get him to come and do it. So that was the one thing where the whole state of play came to and laid down right at the very death was that the the repair guy for the CD cutter was furloughed and he had to be got brought back in off furlough. Other than that, it was all it was all fine. And uh, um, you know, we, we, without kind of being glib about it, the the prevailing atmosphere of that album is up and happy and there's even songs on there i suppose about reassurance and love and um kindness and they all are probably not a bad thing for people to have to listen to at the moment because there's not you know it's been a very good year for music i mean i'm, I'm not just throwing myself in there in part of that because what what we've done is re-release something that people have already heard before but but this I, i'm finding that when I'm really being touched by music this year. It's actually resonating very deeply, you know, and I think we're all a little bit emotionally raw yeah. at the moment because of what's going on in the world. And and music is, is a wonderful thing in that moment. It feels know. more timely again, doesn't it? And I suppose going back yeah. to what you're saying about the, the anniversary thing, if you'd have slapped 30 on on the front, it would have reminded you how bloody long ago it was. <laughs> it, yes, it would remind me that I'm 55. <laughs> uh, yeah, which is like, oh, Christ. Was it a pleasurable yes. experience, though, kind of delving back? Did you forget a lot of stuff? Did, did it bring back happy memories? Or? There's very little that I ever released that I am even have a kind of vague problem with. I think, you know, we spent a lot of time making those records, and generally they were happy you know, I was happy with the results. So having to go back and listen to it is a little bit odd when you repeatedly listen to it, which which you kind of have to do in order to make sure that, that everything is exactly as you want it to be. But um, that, no, no, no. I mean, again, <laughs> the observation is that, in, that that's a nice proper, it's about 45 minute album you know it's not like when you got if you've got to go and reissue your cd that's 70 something minutes long and you just and it's got you know all those dreadful cds that have got those interludes and things like that that people put on them, then you'd be just like oh god you know it was, fun, it, was, it was funny then but it isn't now you know, <laughs> um if you have skits in the middle of your cd and stuff like that but no and then we we did the second disc with um demos and unreleased songs and b-sides and things like that and that was a real pleasure to kind of curate that because apart from anything else having held on to this little cluster of tapes for all these years there was the proper old analog quarter inch tapes from the demos and things like that they they were um actually on top of the bathroom cupboard that's where they lived wow. and it's like so you know they were there and and then they finally got used and that's kind of sweet the egotistical side of the of me is that i the demos i don't know whether it is a, I'm, i quite like the idea that people hear them it's a bit weird because it's obviously if they they might turn and go oh i don't you know it's nothing like the finished thing or whatever like that but it, but i think it explains the process to people and because we didn't release an inordinate amount of music we only made three proper albums over you know so it's not very much so to be able to offer people maybe eight to ten tracks of of stuff they've never heard before this far down the line is quite a nice thing you know i'm not i'm not trying to claim that it's as good as the actual album but it's still valid you know? that's really good to hear that you <laughs> like the thought of releasing demos because i've always wondered with an artist whether it's awkward to kind of release those unfinished songs because I really like to hear them because it's where the journey started, isn't it? It's, it's how the process Absolutely. began. No, I mean, if they were rubbish, then we wouldn't put them out. Yeah. I don't, again, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm, it's, not, it's not quite, I don't know how to, how to think about it. They, they fill in the gaps in a, if, if you were a real fan of The Beloved and 
you have this kind of like incremental understanding of the development of the group. They are actually quite an important part in in the transitional period from us as being a four piece band, which I think is what we were re releasing when I came to talk to you last time. And then in a very short time frame, going from being this sort of, you know, Peel session indie band to two years later being like in the throes of Acid House and sort of, you know, it's a massive, massive it's fantastically exciting time. And 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 for, for better or worse, you can tell there's a sort of it. It's exposing a bit of a kind of magpie tendency in certainly in how I was at the time in that I was just listening to incredibly disparate range of, of artists and sort of go, oh, I'm going to see if I can make it sound a bit like that. I'm not I'm not ashamed to say that, you know, we were wearing our influences very, very much on our sleeve. And because that's how you that's how you learn that's how you create you know so there's even a song on there which i could listen back to it and i'd forgotten about it really and it's 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 almost like trying to write a song like lloyd to sound like lloyd cole and the commotions and it's like well hang on a minute this is the same time as we're going out and making house tracks but i'm still into that and it's you know that's that's the truth of how it was it was like okay you know it's someone asked me in, in an interview last year about my favorite album from from 1990 and thinking you're going to go you know it's going to be house or whatever like that but actually it's cocktail to it this yeah. album is my favorite album you know so it's that there was more there's more going on and in, in a way the way history's framed it it's like everyone was on pills in fields and doing that but actually there was a much much broader scope obviously taking place in music at the time it's not all about raves you know yeah i love that cocktails album as well but one of my yeah. favorites of all time which again i've just, it's just turned up with a 30 year anniversary yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, now blissed out of course came out that same year 1990 are there any plans yes. to, to to expand that because i'm guessing that there are a lot um, of remixes that haven't be, been remastered um that haven't been remastered yes but in terms of re-releasing it the economics don't really stack up to put it on vinyl would be very costly you'd have to put probably a four three or four discs and um we have an audience for what we're doing at the moment we don't have that big an audience to justify i don't think we could afford it i mean the cost of remastering isn't cheap just the actual to do the the studio the days in metropolis doing the remaster i mean I'm, you can get it done cheaper but that's the bit that I would spend the money on. If you're going to remaster your audio, spend the money on the quality of the remaster, not on not on the extra disc of like oddities. It's got to sound really good to justify re-releasing it, um, which I think we achieved with that. And I'm not sure that Blissed Out really warrants it. If we had more fans, yeah, we'd do yeah. it. It, it, I mean, I'm being brutally honest about that. That's you know because there's there's people who shout very loudly in our little Facebook community or whatever, going, "Yeah, we really want this," and I get that they really want it. But I'm, well, the option is either you can crowdfund it, we can do it, or or it just is it's not logistically viable. Yeah, it's got to be the best you know, balance for you, hasn't it, to make it work? Well, it, well, no, I, we got to not lose money doing it, and so that's good. To do blissed out, it's going to be fifteen hundred. You're fifteen hundred quid before you've even got you know then you've got to press it then you've got to package it then you've got to sell it um you'd we'd have to sell several thousand copies of it and we don't have that that size of audience yeah, yeah. you know uh, you know we, uh, that's the brutal economics of it it's, yeah, and, it's a lot um, of money. and because it's all available in 24-bit dig on the band camp and i you see my because i don't fetishize vinyl quite so well now i remember you've got cds haven't you oh, yeah You're but not, i love vinyl you, though yeah I, i've just started recollecting yeah, so do I, but I don't Okay, but do you collect it or do you play it? Uh, I, I play it as well, but I, I guess it's easier not to play vinyl. It's, yeah, it depends what I mean. I mean, you have to lug it yeah. all out. But I, I like that process of actually looking through credits and looking through sleeve notes. Oh, yeah, I, I get all of that. I totally get all of that. But in terms of, like, if I was a fan of a band and wanted just to have everything, the fact that it's available in in, digital, in high-quality digital files is sort of enough for me i don't know i but i know that isn't the same for other people but it's kind of hard the one thing that you kind of i, I love music i'm a real massive fan of music but i think the one thing that over time you lose because you become part of the machinery is that collecting fetishism because it just sort of i i, I was like that when i was younger and then once you become the th you you become the commodity that people are collecting. I think it's slightly weird, you know. You don't you sort of you, maybe I want to downplay it, 
because I feel a bit odd about the idea. You know, when people put up pictures of their collections of all my records and things like that, I mean, it's it's amazing. But I'm like, oh my god, you know, that's quite. That's yeah. It's it's what I was like when I was a kid. Yeah, you know, yeah. with my league records or my whatever you know it's like yeah. i did get a question from tom swindon actually about blissed out he says what's your favorite mix on that album you've probably answered this in interviews before uh, maybe probably it's like she's the... your favorite child isn't it <laughs> not an easy so that's one. It. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> it won't be yeah we won't go into that now that could be embarrassing you could, you could do you could do rotating three three edits with three different names in it yeah okay um there's a re- I've said this before. I think my favourite mix of all of them is the, this, um, which I think is on the vinyl. So it's on all the versions. Is the, Cal- the Calyx of Isis mix of Your Love Takes Me Higher, which is I can just associate from, from that because I wasn't in the room when the mix was done. It was Steve and Martin Phillips who was the producer, and I we'd done a house mix which came out. And then I was kind of burnt out. I'd been out partying far too much and I was just exhausted and left them to it. And they did, they created this incredible kind of like, um, it's like a journey really, because it starts off as a breakbeat and then it ends up in a completely sort of ambient textural mix. And so it's like two mixes somehow combined as one. And it blew me away when I first heard it. I still love it. And it, and I, I feel I'm allowed to to really love it because it isn't me who did it. That's the thing, you know. Um, it would be slightly too self-aggrandizing if it was like, "Well, the mix, I my mix, I like my mix best," you know. <laughs> uh, uh, which I do, but you know. Um, so no, there's yeah, that that would be the one. The whole blissed out thing. I I mean, I really really love it, and to me, it's a valid. It's not just a remix album because it's it's a kind of an. A, another window of where we were in our gestation as a band. I mean, it, Happiness was made in 1989 and Blissed Out was what we were doing in the studio the following 12 months, really. Every time we had a chance to get back in to rework a track, we, we'd take that ourselves. You know, other people did them, but we would do it ourselves as well. And that was, a, you know, in a kind of way, I think had me and Steve gone on to make another album, it would have been in that vein it would have been amazing i'm um, unfortunately circumstance intervened and it didn't happen but the um it's a str- it's a more interesting yeah we will find still finding our own unique sound even through that process so yeah and what else, you know it's all right now was the one new track we did at the end of that process and then then we stopped you know so and what about conscience because i know you you didn't really want to do that anniversary thing necessarily but obviously we've got two and a bit years before the anniversary for that album is that likely to well, be expanded? Yeah, it's, all, it's all gone yes it, oh yeah it's well it will get remastered definitely um because the the demand will be there also because the the technology i mean the technology now is such that the remastering really benefits the audio and that you know anything done in that kind of early 90s period will be substantially improved by remastering the weird thing is is that the, because the interruption of what's happened this year and is still ongoing is that me and steve had got much more specific plans around this happiness thing and we were going to seriously consider playing live with that like with me and him again um, we've got new stuff that we've been working on not because it's like oh listen to our new songs but that that also needs to be finished and we haven't been in a room together for the last six months because we i mean we can now well i think we can now yeah who knows um, <laughs> who knows what we can and can't do <laughs> but we still haven't managed to get it together yet because i've only really been back in london a few weeks and um and I'm not there now, am I? So um, if you're listening to the government, you should be wearing your mask right now <laughs> for this Skype chat. There we go. I got mine as well. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All today, isn't it? Your, yours yeah, is fetching. Really, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Your, yeah, mine's disposable, which is bad for the environment, folks. So, um, I was going to ask you about the touring, though. The, well, the playing live. I, I think touring is a bit ambitious, isn't it? Maybe. Well, especially now. It's it's really it's um. It's weird. We really were considering it as a possibility and we talked to people about it and there was certainly demand for it. But the investment needed in that, because we don't, you know, it's not like when you're a band and everyone's got their equipment and you, you know, you just do it every couple of years or whatever, that's fine. This is something that we haven't done for 30 years. We don't have the equipment. We'd have to buy it or whatever. 
So we'd, with the investment in it and the time and thing into it, would just about be doable if we knew we had guaranteed shows to play. And we'd got as far as almost having that. But now the security of that is gone. If, if, we, if we were to sit here and go, yeah, okay, we've got 12 gigs next year, um, you know, and they would, would have been like sort of festival slots and things like that. We would have generated enough money for us to do it. But now we can't even take that risk because those things may not happen. It's really just, it's really sad. I mean, because for us, it's not the end of the world because it's not our bread and butter and it's not what we do. But if you are a band that tours and that's your livelihood, in the same way that DJs have been absolutely destroyed by this, it's fucking awful. You know, it's like, what what are you going to do? Because there's no way of knowing. I mean, I've got tickets, gigs that I was supposed to go to this year. Some got cancelled, some got rescheduled. So in theory, I've got three gigs in my diary for next year to go and see bands. But there's no way of knowing whether this is still going to take place. So I, d I don't, we can't invest in it. There's no point, you know, and that's a real shame because getting back to your other question, that was, this sort of had a nice narrative to it because me and Steve could have done that and see where that got us. And, you know, who knows where that would have got us. And then the whole conscience thing would have a natural progression as something further down the line. But actually, if, if I'm not doing the live stuff and if we're not able to do anything else like that, then we might actually just bring that forward because it's, because it's what else can you do in in a lockdown world? What else can you do? But um, but then again, I've then I've got a rope Helena back into that as well. And she she's like you know, it's bad enough that I've had a kind of peripheral existence with music over this period of time, and she's had nothing to do with it. And she is now a trained counsellor in mental well, in mental health, and she can't suddenly put her she can't really put herself back into even into vision because that would be compromise the ethics of the work that she's doing so so it's really weird but i mean again the thing about conscience is that it contains the killer hit you know sweet harmony is what most people know the beloved as i mean in lots of countries we are a one hit wonder that's it fair enough um so yes that will get redone and i'm pretty sure we'll get a lot of arm twisting from the label to want to get mixes done of it and stuff like that because it you know it it's insane how how successful that record is still you know that's what i basically live on is the royalties from that that song yeah. you know it's it's extraordinary that that can do that you know and people keep trying to cover it and do terrible versions of it and it's like well let's get some i mean i've got some good idea, p ideas for people to do mixes i mean uh, you know they're all like uber cool and really clever and that's probably not what people want but but you know, there's a lot of scope, scope there because it never really got re it never even had mixes done at the time. You know, I really enjoy seeing you collaborating with West Band. Well, particularly that that yeah. uh, gig. Well, the gig. I said the performance that you did was the it TV show, yeah. German TV. Yeah, I did that at the very start of March. Um, again, a, that was really weird. I was in Berlin on the Monday. We did the TV show on the Monday. Shot a video on the, no, shot the video on the Monday night. Did a TV show on the Tuesday. On Wednesday, they took me sightseeing, by by, and I flew back. By Friday, the city was locked down. It was like two days, and that's why I understood what was going to happen in the UK because I'd seen it at close quarters. We went round a museum on a Wednesday, but they'd shut all the museums within two days of that, and it was um, people's behaviour there was was more cautious but yeah we still did a live tv show in front of a studio audience and everyone being very sort of leaning away from each other yeah. <laughs> but um but that was really good fun to do i mean again without sort of um downplaying myself i, I hadn't done anything like that for years and years. not this century did it did it feel to terrifying kind of, to be back on stage did it feel exhilarating or mixed with both? Um, it's quite useful being the feet when you're the feet you don't get any of the attention so you are literally wheeled onto stage to sing, even on the you know he's the one in the centre. It's brilliant. He's in the centre of the stage, like doing him, he, doing whatever he was doing, you know. And he's a top bloke. He's really nice, but he's a massive star in Germany, and I was just the feet on the side of the stage. And then you know he's the one who got interviewed and bloody fast. So it was fine. It was completely fine. I, it was quite nice to be involved in something 
where you're not the centre of attention at all. It's a good way to get back into it, I suppose, isn't it? Like a yeah. gradual process, yeah. 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 But and having got back into it and really enjoyed it, of course, that's bloody gone as well because we had we had some big plans for that. We, you know, we could have been doing a lot of stuff through the summer. They, I mean, we they even we didn't even bother getting club mixes done in the end because there's no clubs. Yeah, it's it's you know, sad. it's such a great track as well. Thank you. No, it is good. It is kind of um, weirdly enough. I'm going in. I'm doing another one with him this week. Um, that um, well, I'm de- I'm demoing a vocal idea for for a track for for his album on. We should have been tomorrow. I'm going to do it on Wednesday now because I'm still in court. <laughs> lucky the, you, uh, lucky you, not jealous at all here. So, um, <laughs> and so I'm going to go and try it. And I because his his album's really cool. He's got Richard Butler from Psychedelic Furs has done a track that's really good. He's got a certain sound, and I mean, I don't know that he's. I don't think he sells a huge amount of of records or downloads or whatever like that. But it's weird. He's always. I mean, everyone knows him in Germany. It's bizarre. He's visually recognisable. Wherever you go, we went out for dinner. We went out. It might have been a Berlin thing, but I think it's everywhere. I mean, you know, he. I'm trying to think of. There's not really an equivalent in the UK. It's as though someone had been around as long as, say, Carl Cox, and would be then recognised every time he went down the street as Carl Cox or whatever. You know, that kind of sort of thing. But but, but yes, it's 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 it's, it's extraordinary. We discovered that me and him were born a day apart and I, I mean i'm not into astrology at all but he really he is and so he's obsessed with the idea that we are basically twins you know so uh, kindred so, spirits well yeah i think we are kindred spirits that was really good i mean he was really i enjoyed the whole thing so much um because we'd made the track without ever meeting and then i went and finally met, i know his manager that's how i did it i've known him guido for years but i've never met max and then but yeah so Hopefully, if I get another feat on his album, he's so confident in his own kind of persona, and uh, I quite like that. You know, I'm not I'm not great about being the centre of attention, or never really was that good at it. But but it's quite interesting to see someone who's just happy doing what he does. You know, and uh, you know, but but then weirdly enough, he, they, he actually did a club gig last week and in Krakow in Poland with 500 people, and I saw the footage of it. And I was just like. Wow. This is it's not a good idea. Terrifying. Yeah. yeah. Seriously. Don't what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> why are you letting people why are they letting people into clubs? Apparently that was socially distanced. Five hundred is considered to be okay. you know. Safe. So five hundred one, no, five hundred. And we're thinking we've got six. Yeah. They got five hundred yeah. young people dancing in the club with no masks on it's like mm. so do you know what's happening in the next few few months are you able to do any more work or are you able to think about christmas because i guess a lot of us don't really know oh, what the God. hell's going on i don't think i ever think about christmas till about the second week of december okay, yeah, you're <laughs> i think what will happen is that me and steve will just get into a studio together and just and start trying to to finish the stuff that we've done because that would have been part of our process anyway and if we're not going to play live we've got we've got a lot of unfinished business and we get on so well we almost need someone with a big stick to beat us to kind of make us do things you know we both have perfectly happy lives doing things that don't involve us doing that so to sort of galvanize that to happen as well it's not like if he lived if he lived in the same if we lived in the same part of town or something it would be so much easier but he doesn't he lives a bit outside london so we have to everything has to be thought through he has a life he has a a business that he's a non-music thing that he does on the assumption that the schools don't shut and my kids don't end up back in the house then i could start working again in the house I had a lot of grandiose ideas to be created during lockdown but then i realized that sharing space with loads of people means you can't because you're sort of you don't have the privacy and the time so actually that that is something that hopefully if we don't go back into that state i'll be able to do again because um i spent my whole time my whole year just being on call dad which was nice but um but i i could do with a bit of me time john it's so good to chat to you again I'm excited okay. to see where nice where this goes next and obviously all your other work and particularly the new Beloved yeah. material. That's very, very exciting. Cheers, Phil. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your time in Cornwall. Oh, well, well, yeah, that's about another four hours. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, the most, so see, see you soon. You.